So that is what I, I recommend right now, especially for the kids in the younger generation. You know, if you want to connect with them, that's what you do. Put yourself out there, have a blog, be serious about it, and put those meta tags in, and you can get connected. Having said all that, I do also realize that my, for my own marketing, I have a niche audience, right? Mine is military enthusiasts, Naval Academy folks, EOD folks, and so what I try to do also is be true and remain, you know, focused on that, that audience and connect with them. Uh, it's for that reason, as I described earlier, that right now part of I'm I'm, I'm connecting with the Naval Academy uh, on this whole thing of using the recipient son for honor remediation. Don't misunderstand me. There's always a pragmatic part behind it. Is I hope they buy it. I hope that folks see the book and see the value in it. And, that's part of what that's about. I think I already talked about the sales method with an impact about uh, free marketing uh, with your book on Amazon.com. And for me, those are my notes for today. Does anybody have any questions about Naval Academy, writing, different methods of publication, my own publication journey, PMO, and any of that kind of stuff? Sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, how did you track the traditional publishing house initially? I did. How far did you go? I mean, where did you decide to stop? Yeah, so when I first started, I went two avenues, both with I was trying to connect with agents and then also with the smaller firms at the same time. And in doing that, I went to like the agent websites and tried to find agents that clearly were interested in the type of stuff that I was writing. I did the same thing with the publishers. And I did start first with small publishers because the larger ones I experienced won't talk to you. Random House won't talk to them, they'll only talk to the agents. Um, so, Naval Institute Press was included in that, and they just were not interested in proximity time. And I think I just got a quick letter back from them saying, thank you, we're not interested for whatever reason. Um, and so, it was sort of my third step was connecting with these Navy diver guys and saying, you know, hey, would you read this? What do you think of this? And that Dick Couch connected me with his agent. Um, the, uh, the challenge of a, of a smaller traditional publishing firm is, so, that, so the good part is, you have access. They're willing to hear what you have to say, and your chances are much better because a, a smaller firm with a, with a focused market, um, uh, and if you have the expertise that they want, and if you're interested, you know, they will pick you up. That's, I'm convinced that's why it happened for me the second time with the able to do press. Um, the challenge is you, your audience is smaller. You know, I, the number of books that, of mine with recipients on that ended up in a brick and mortar store, you know, not so much. So. Um, but that, for me, that's part of the journey. I really feel like, for me right now, as a writer, that's where I belong with the Naval Institute Press. So. But how many um, submissions did you send out to the traditional houses? Yeah, so I sent it, uh, I'm going to say it was uh, in the 20s. It was hard for me to find them um, that were sort of about, about the right nature, interested in my type of books and everything. And I'll tell you what some of them are now I'm finding is, there was a lot of them I would peel back, and I would end up finding out that it's a writer. A writer, a small group of writers that decided to form their own publishing firm, and they did it that way. So maybe they only have five or six titles as it is, and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure, man, sure. Um, I was just familiar with the, the name of the guy, right. so um, he, he was uh, in the Air Force and Marines and the, uh, the Army, and uh, I, I, I believe the Army. Absolutely. Um, so the U.S. Navy EOD community was the first one that was formed, and it was formed by a guy who also was named Academy graduate, class of '33, Draper Kaufman. There's a longer version to his story, but basically he was deemed uncommissional at graduation. He served in a merchant fleet. When World War II breaks out, he started serving in the ambulance corps in France, and he ends up serving with the Royal Navy, and they teach him mine and bomb disposal. When the U.S. enters the war, he comes back to the United States and he founded the U.S. Navy's first EOD school. They called it Bob Disposal School. And he did it, in fact, as a day leave of, of all services. He had one schoolhouse in the D.C. area and one up in Aberdeen where the Army guys were housed. Um, for that reason, to this day, the school is a naval school and it's called Naval School Explosive Ordnance Disposal, or EOD School for short. It's at Eglin Air Force Base now in Florida. When I went through, the first phase was in England Air Force Base, and the second phase was in Indian Head, Maryland, now it's all down there. And 
all services go through the same school. It was in Southern Capstone. All services go through the same school. And it is the only uh, warfare device that is worn by all four services is the EOD crack bomb disposal symbol that's on the back of the book. There's other qualification things like jump wings. Jump wings are not a warfare device. It's the only warfare device that's worn by all of the services. Um, very tightly connected across all of the services as a result. And we interoperate with EOD techs of the other services all of the time. Um, when I was in uh, Albania, as an example, one of the things that happens is students will fail out of part of the course because it's a tough curriculum. I used to say it's like the physical part of buds of SEAL training and the mental part of new power school all rolled into one. We would, uh, students will fail one or two tests, and if you fail two tests, you can get kicked out or you can get rolled back. So inevitably, a class that shows up as an all-Navy class, Within you know seven, eight, ten weeks, all of a sudden it's a mix of Army, Air Force, Marines that have rolled back into your class, and of course some of the Navy students have rolled back into the other class. So over time, the classes all become a mix of services. But then what that means is if you go anywhere in the world and you encounter other EOD techs, and you have a connection with them. So my attachment showed up in Albania. There was an Air Force EOD detachment there. One of the guys in that class was in my, or on that detachment was in my class. Instant, you know, so not only are we all EOD techs, but personal connection of being in the same class together, so we ended up working together. So that happens all the time. Same thing, yeah. All, all the services do new weapons uh, response and the like, for sure. Yeah. So, how does it look like the book signing the lost leader? I'm sorry? Why is the book signing the lost leader? Is it because we have to buy the, the right. shelf? No, no, so I do get them at a resale price. I get them at a discounted price. But just when you think about the, 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 the still, the volume is very low. And when you put in the gas and the travel and the time, yeah, you end up, you end up losing them. And then there's some of them that end up on the, you end up in the inventory and that sort of thing. There's other uh, costs that I try to account for, but so I do have an online store through Square Up, which is connected with the Square Card Rider thing. Um, so I try to build in as much as I can sort of the cost of the shipping and everything else, but it's, there ends up still being other stuff that ends up getting absorbed in different places. So, but yeah, so you just don't make that much on it. And the, the, the amount that you make on any book is such a small piece anyway, so. And, and was there a, a choice between, um, did you struggle between uh, hardback, hardcover, and soft cover? Exlibris is a book, part of the package, which is one of the things that I liked about it. So Amazon, for example, creates space. I think that to this day, create space will only do trade paperback. And so one of the things that I liked about Ex Libris was um, hardcover and trade paperback both offered from the start and ad infinitum forever. So that's, an, that's one of the things that I like about a print-on-demand firm is at some point, the Naval Institute Press will make a decision to discontinue the recipient. But by the contract, it's super ostensibly, as long as people will order it, people will, they'll, they will print copies of approximately. But with Ex Libris, you have no choice about the pricing, right? The, the, only, the only book you could correct. You priced yourself was an ebook. That's correct. So with Ex Libris, at the time, they priced the book based on the number of words mm -hmm. for both of them. And I think it's priced a little high. It moves, but I do think it's priced a little high. They now have a pack, well, Exclusivers now has a package of if you pay a higher fee up front, and it's expensive, I want to say it's like $15,000, they will then allow you to set the price of your book, uh, you know, as it, as it gets published. Uh, I'm not sure that I would bite off that much myself either, so. But an interesting thing about the ebook pricing is, I think the Naval, this is another one, turn off the tape, I think the Naval Institute press, uh, prices the ebooks too high. Um, there, there's this thing that I think is happening with the traditional publishers is, and I understand where they're coming from, they're saying it's intellectual property, and they want to try to create this notion similar to the music business of the price of an album is the price of an album, whether you buy it as you know, digital download for your iPod, or a CD, or whatever the format is, you're paying for the intellectual property. The thing that I think is happening in the reader's world is they have so many choices of books that are out there, inexpensive, and there's this thing that somebody has of, I'm gonna download this electronic book, I'm gonna read it once, maybe I'll read it twice. I can't really loan it to anybody. I know there's some platforms out there that allow you to loan it, whatever. And I think when they see a book priced at 16 bucks for an ebook, I think it's just daunting, and, and people pass up, so. Sir, in the back. You talked about uh, the ways you 
you might flesh out your characters. Right. Uh, I was wondering, do you use multiple POV? Do you, do you switch I do. I use, I, use, I, I use multiple points of view because what I want to do is have the uh, uh, audience identify with each of the characters, and I try to create a little bit of conflict with one another. So here's an example. Jazz Dzinski, the OIC of the DOD detachment. Part of his background, as you learned, is that uh, this is another Disney thing. He said he's in the personal struggle with his father, who's an admiral. He's got turmoil that's going on with his wife. He's trying to prove himself to this team. This is an actual thing that happens with young DOD officers, though. He has a senior chief who's been doing bomb disposal since he was in elementary school, and he all of a sudden is in charge of it. And there's that conflict that goes on there. I had with Elena Cruz, who was the FBI agent. Her thing is sort of, uh, I'm trying to uh, succeed in this uh, male club of the FBI, and how do I do that? And you hear her conversations and her thoughts about how she's going to wrestle through that kind of stuff. Similarly, one of the, uh, the bad guys, his name is Gabriel, is the white supremacist in South Texas. So here's a guy that I show you sort of his journey a little bit, where you follow him and his conversations with folks where he started off that he was in the military and he thought he was going to be, um, you know, rough and tumble and, and machismo and a Spartan environment, and he found it wasn't, and that was part of his disappointment. So he got connected with these hard guys that were in the military that turned out that they were connected to white supremacists. And so a small detail is, I talk about him as a kid reading the sand pebbles, and saying that's what he imagined the Navy was going to be like. And so I, I take you into his world and have his point of view and, and, and his own thoughts and that sort of thing. So try to flesh it out that way. Sure. See, we've had a lot of conversations today, so I know you talked about your writing process in that detail before. And, and my takeaway from that would be if you, if you don't actually outline it, it's outlined in your brain, you know the scenes you need. Right. So I'm curious, when you actually sit down to write those scenes, do you write them in chronological order, or you just, or you just write them in whatever, yeah. whatever mood you're in? Whatever mood I'm in. Yeah. So let me come back to the outline first. Yeah. I start by thinking of what is going to be the storyboard, and I'll start just writing, I have to have an ID scene, I have to have a dialogue scene, I have to have a conflict with the wife. And I'll just write up little things like that. But then I will get to a point where I will physically write an outline. And then after I write that outline will fit the theme, I actually will write the theme. The theme of this chapter is the theme that I want to come from this chapter. I'll put that on Microsoft Word on the page. The theme, themes in this chapter will be. Um, I will do an outline, but then when I write it, I'm not writing it on the I write it for whatever I'm inspired to write about today. And I'll write it. Sometimes I'll sit down and I'll write two or three paragraphs, and then I'm kind of stuck, and I'll put that aside, and I'll go on, and I'll pick up the next one, and I'll write a little bit for the next one like that. And then even though I do have an outline, I will find that I will go back and I might change things in their time sequence order. But time is an interesting thing too. It's, it's one of the things that I do in the editing process is try to make sure that the time is congruent. And it doesn't seem like, I don't want to have jumps or leaps in time. I want most of the action to be occurring, you know, relatively close together, that kind of a thing. Um, another thing I talk about editing with the characters' names and saying Elena and searching for Elena. I will go through and search all of the days and make sure if I said it was Tuesday and the guy was doing something tomorrow, I better make sure that it's Wednesday if I refer to it. Or I imply that it's a work day, you know, things of that nature. You have to do those little subtle things because a reader will pick up on that. You know, you may not if you've taken two years to write something, but a reader will grab that. So yeah. So there's obviously things that you know very inherently because of your experience, and there's a lot of other things that you need to do research on. Absolutely. Um, do you simply sort of do that as as it occurs to you? Okay, now I need to find out sort of FBI procedure here. Right. Like that. So is it to, as you come upon it, or as you're doing your outline, perhaps? Sure. Like, okay, I really need to find out about this, this, and this. It's a little bit of both. So one of the things that I'll do as I'm writing is I will I will write to myself and I'll stop and I will write a note and say I'm not in the mood to do research right now, but I will literally write down need to research dot dot dot. And I'll put a bubble in there, I'll use the Microsoft comment function, and later I'll read and I'll come to that point and I'll go, okay, I'm in the mood now, I'll do that. Now I go on the internet and I start looking that thing up, right? Um, there are other times that I'm in the mood and I will just quickly say, okay, close this window, go to the internet and look the thing up and, and go from there. One of them is, here's a good example. I happen to know this one is in my brain because I did this one the other day. Is I have a character in my book and he's putting on, it's the traditional Afghan hat, and I don't know what the name of the hat is. I know it has a name, 
but I know that I've written that down, and at some point I'm going to go back and go traditional Afghan hat and find it off, that's it, and fill in whatever the name is, too. I do research, though, believe it or not, the things that I know also. Um, I feel like that's part of my responsibility to the audience to make sure that I do things right. So this is something that I think some people may not necessarily do. In writing the recipient song, one of the things I did was I have a scene where the characters walking down Stripling Walk, if you guys are familiar, from the Comes to Court, past the chapel on the left, towards the classroom buildings. And I said to myself, I know what it looks like in my brain to me, but what does it really look like to other people? What is it going to look like to people who've been there? And I have to make sure that it's right. I actually went there with a video camera and walked and stopped and stood and filmed it around to make sure I had the notion and had the distance and the spacing right. If I'm standing here, what I see her and that kind of thing, you have to have that. If you don't do it, it won't ring true. Um, I've done it recently with diving, and, uh, so I'm writing a sequel to Proximity, and in it, uh, divers are doing uh, in-water recompression diving with a reef breather. And so part of the excitement for people who are military enthusiasts and who are picking it up to read about military diving, it's an interesting aspect. US Navy, I'm going to say it again, US Navy EOD tanks dive a Mark 16 reef breather to the great depths. You can dive to 300 feet. We dive as a single diver because if you have two diving, you want to be able to dive as many people as possible in a minefield. And if something goes wrong, you only lose one diver. You don't, you know, if the mine blows up, you only lose one. And we also do in-water decompression, single diver in-water decompression. So that means that as they're doing the diving operation, when they're finished, he knows, so I went to 300 feet, I have four decompression stops that I have to go through. I'm doing a stop at 40 feet for so much time, and 30 feet for so much time, and 20 feet for so much time. I don't remember what those numbers are. They're in the diving manual. So I actually went back and did research, read the diving manual, because I know there's some guy out there who will go, that's it's 40 feet for 10 minutes, not 40 feet for 50, right? You have to have that right. If you don't, you're going you're gonna to get called out on it. So I do have to do research. Yes, ma'am. So do you put your research, um, your geography, in the end of your book? I don't. No. I don't, because they're fiction, I have. Make sure that it's accurate and you know as accurate as can be, and, and, and I go from there. Sure. Do you, do you let the uh, the action or the facts sort of uh, resolve, or do you, or do you do you strive to have something mysterious uh, to kind of keep it suspenseful? Right. So I would say in proximity, it's, there's a little bit of suspense. As a matter of fact, a criticism that folks have said is proximity ends abruptly, and I wanted to have more. That's written a lot. Well, I purposely have written it with the intention of having a, uh, a sequel to it that I'm working on right now. It's been a long time coming, but I am working on a sequel to it. Um, so I purposely have several sort of things that are unresolved in that first book. Now, in The Recipient Son, I would say that's not the case. When I wrote The Recipient Son, I really finished, wrote it thinking, when I'm finishing this, it's coming to its conclusion and it's going to be done. I've had people say, oh, I want to find out what more happens. And, I just, I just think that book was written as, I think it's, it's done. So. Any other questions? The main yes. thing you need is a really sexy name for EOD. Right. EOD. Now, you, can make, you make it up and you convince the name. That's right. Use it. That's and right. And that will boost their morale. It'll boost their morale. It'll get the people who want to become EOD technicians in the region. Exactly. It is, it is, so you've opened the door for me for two stories. So the, the first one is, it is true. This is, so there are web pages for everything, right? Well, there's a web page where you do text code and you do chat and stuff. And one of the things that we've been talking about recently and laughing about is, because IAPs are more well-known because of the war care, and because EOD texts are more well-known because people have written articles about it and the like, and you had the movie a while back, The Hurt Locker, right? So we've had our first ever EOD phony guy that was pretending to be a Navy EOD technician that revealed itself. To, so you had two threads of conversation. One, the guy's going, we got to find that guy. We're going to call the Veterans Administration. He should be arrested. It's Stolen Valor. And another line going, we clearly are finally getting the recognition we deserve <laughs> because somebody's trying to pretend they're one of us. So the, the other thing I wanted to say about sexy name, you'll find this interesting. I actually wrote an article one time that was called The Birth of the Combined Explosives Exploitation Cell. What a combined explosives exploitation cell basically is a military bomb squad CSI. Okay? These are guys that go and do post-blast analysis of an IED event to 
try to figure out who the bad guys are. Bombers have what's called a bomb maker profile. If the guy who uses a glue gun, he uses a lot of glue, a little bit of glue. If he likes a particular circuit board, if he likes a particular battery. So you can actually find, and maybe they literally put their fingerprints on the device, etc. So the first sexy who stood up was a little bit ad hoc. Several people were put together, and they needed a sexy name. Somebody literally wrote on a whiteboard, C E X C, sexy. EX is explosives, what's the rest of our name? <laughs> and they brainstormed and they came up with combined explosives exploitation cell, and that's how they got it. <laughs> All right. See? Now you just have to use it. You heard it, you heard it here. We have a son right over here from the UK. So we had this friend of my son's calls, and he said, he went to West Westbrook, and he said, he said, God, he said, if they call you Mrs. Brenner, please tell them how bad I am. He says, I want out of here. Oh, really? <laughs> he says, tell him anything. Right. Everything. Get me out of here. Yeah. He owes me money. You know where he is? He owes me money. <laughs> He's got that gambling problem. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Last time I saw him, he was leaving with his Iranian girlfriend. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Certainly. Thank you.